of the U.S. Okay. Um, um, is there anything I'm supposed to do on my end as far as should I am I should be okay nope I'm going to take care of everything on the zoom part you got your job is just to host and okay. bring the bring it you got to bring your whole personality bring the whole conversation light up this this, this stuff all right all right let me tell my daughter turn it turn it down <laughs> all right before we go do we have any questions you feel good about the food and stuff like that? It's eight seven fifty six now. Um, you good, Rebecca? Yeah, I feel good. Okay, we can jump on. All right, let me spotlight you guys so that okay. we have it all ready. Turn that down. Yeah. I'm gonna change my name. And then I'll introduce myself last since I won't be on the actual screen. You know what I mean? Okay. Who you want to talk first? Um, I spotlighted myself. Oops. You, know, you nice. want to go first? I'll like introduce myself first. No, I mean like you want to just talk first or? No. Okay. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> okay. I'll start. <laughs> no. Okay. I'll start. No. Right. You. You. Did. You. You're. Would much better than I would introduce. You're hilarious. Okay. No problem. Okie dokie. I'm ready, uh, Karen. Okay, y'all. I'm sorry. I had to scream at the kids before we, we get on. <laughs> <laughs> How are you going to let us know we're on? Um, I'll, I can, I'll, I'll, let's see. I think you probably be able to see it. Let's see it. I think we could chat each other. Yeah. It also says recording, I think, on um, when you're going Facebook Live. I think it says recording, you know? Oh, you're right. I don't know. I'm not on Facebook. Go on the live. So. Click on the live Facebook. All right, okay. we'll see this here on my own timeline. Share to my page, she said. I'm doing that. Um, okay, and then, okay, y'all, here we go. Okay. All right. So I think we're live right now. No, wait, it takes a second. So just hold on. Okay. And then just put like a reaction up. Yay. okay perfect perfect yay all right so good evening everyone how's everybody doing um we're so glad to have you all with us here tonight uh it's november thursday november 4th 2021 and we are here uh opening up for mec melanated educators of color uh to have a open conversation just about the importance of black educators um bipoc ed educators in the classroom and i'm here with uh some core members of the whole crew uh, uh, here and we can go around and introduce ourselves. We have some uh, wonderful uh, ladies on screen and behind the screens helping us out tonight. So um, uh, we can go around and introduce ourselves uh, really quickly. Oh, I can get started. <laughs> um, my name is Jahan Thomas. I am a visual artist, museum and community arts educator located in Philadelphia, and I am on uh, Lenny Lenape land. So um, as a visual description, um, I'm a black woman with long locks. I have glasses on and a mustard colored t-shirt. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jahad, for uh, sharing who you are to the audience. Um, I'm Melissa Park. I am uh, Brooklyn raised, Brooklyn born, uh, teaching artist, uh, creativist, uh, educator, Afro conceptualist, thinker, <laughs> maverick. And I am the founder of the Black Teaching Artist Lab and the Afrocentric Social Emotional Learning. Um, and I think my whole mission really is to provide resources and tools for Black teaching artists from across the diaspora. Uh, visual description, I am tired. <laughs> I'm wearing glasses like a, like a cat-shaped framed glasses with a very old sweater, a turtleneck sweater, um, and a head tie. Um, and I'm really excited to be here. <laughs> That's your turn. <laughs> Hi, my name is Rebecca Sintron Moisica. Um, I'm currently living in Camden, New Jersey, which is Occupy Lenny and Lenape land. 
Um, a visual description, I'm an olive skin tone woman wearing a blue, yellow, beige sweater. Um, I have brown, wavy hair. Um, as far as myself, I'm a Boricua living in the diaspora. I'm a decolonial culture educator. My work mainly being focused um, within museums and cultural centers. I'm also a grad student at NYU um, studying Latin American and Caribbean studies. Yes, and we can't forget um, our wonderful tech uh, helping us out. Uh, did you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. I'm behind the scenes, but my name is Karen Williams. I am a new Melanated Educative Corps member. I am an educator, and as far as my description, I am somewhat <laughs> light brown with red curly locks, which I absolutely love. And I am wearing my glasses so I can protect my eyes because I am getting older. And I am just excited to be here tonight. You guys are going to rock and I cannot wait to get this conversation started. So welcome core members as well as all our guests out there. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right, so yay, okay, perfect. So we uh, all did, um, got to know each other a little bit more. and. You know, over the course of tonight, we're really just going to be talking about the importance of Black and BIPOC educators within the classroom. Um, also, to bring a little bit more um, uh, just ideas and awareness around the topic and to, you know, interest anyone new that would be interested in uh, becoming a core member or, um, you know, affiliated with the uh, organization. So, um, just like the, we're just going to be like flowing, you know, and just asking a few questions. We have a few questions that we uh, have been really thinking about together, um, just as a group. And we have other core members uh, represented. Um, they're just not here tonight. So, we definitely want to shout out um, to everybody uh, at MEC. Um, so, one of our first questions that we've been pondering together are, you know, you know, what, what is your teaching philosophy or, um, you know, some of you already mentioned, you know, um, kind of like your perspectives on how to teach and um, in the particulars, you know, what brought you to that like lens, like that approach, because you figure, uh, you know, Black and BIPOC educators come in so many different ways. I mean, we have so many different audiences and with so many different needs and, you know, and we have so many different communities. So, you know, how did you, you know, hone in on your approach, um, you know, so that that can be stronger to to help with, um, you know, the audiences that you encounter? And we can go around. I could start. Um, I know for me, uh, a lot of the conversations that I have is obviously is around race um, and a lot of the spaces where you talk about race is um, equity and diversity and inclusion and anti-racism and dismantling, you know, white supremacy, which are all things that are real and we really do need to talk about. But oftentimes, um, you know, when you hear when I hear that word against, it's like or anti, you, you hear against or you're fighting, and. You know, it, it doesn't come for me, it doesn't feel like it's coming from a place of like, hey, like we're, up, we're uplifting or we're talking about a culture. So for me, you know, looking at, you know, the diasporic and the pan African and the African diasporic uh, cultures as a, as something that we have and something that we could teach other than like, this is against white supremacy and this is against, you know, white culture. It's like, look, like this is who we are and this is what we're doing. This is our own history. And and looking at it through an artistic lens is really important. So, um, you know, changing the conversation for me about not so much about, it, it's always about race, but it's also about our culture and, and understanding our culture. And I think that's really important. Uh, moving forward. Uh, um, um, no, I totally feel that. Um, thank you so much for sharing that, Melissa. It's it's really important. It's almost like um, life saving to not come from you know just one aspect of you know our history, but that it kind of the lens kind of needs to show the full three hundred and sixty of you know our culture, like um you know black history you know BIPOC history it's, it's also American history so it's like mm -hmm. just just one end of it um 
which how it's taught, you know, predominantly now, you know, with like a pain, just like a pain lens, you know, there are so many other enriching ways to learn about the full spectrum of our histories. Yeah, I just do want to note that anti-racist teachings and like that is important history like i i definitely do not want to discredit anyone who's doing that type of work that work is needed but we also need to uh, like have this and a lot of folks are doing it already um is, is looking at that perspective so it's not need either or it's just um and i think just want to note that <laughs> put that in the ether um yeah so going off of that it's so interesting that you mentioned that a lot of our teachings, it tends to sound like anti-white supremacy. It's always the anti. And I always think, yes, it may be upsetting to um, folks of European descent, white folks, but also it's not my ancestors fault that this is how it has to be taught. Like it wasn't their doing, it was your doing. So it's almost as if this is a problem issue y'all have to deal with because I'm going to teach it in a way, whatever it is that I'm teaching, my culture in particular, I'm going to teach it so that indigeneity is censored and Blackness is censored um, as they are the most marginalized identities. Um, and going from there, just organically, it's going to come up being anti-white supremacist um, because our livelihood, our existence was on the line. Um, so for myself, um, I particularly chose museum settings and cultural centers because I loved teaching, but I noticed that the traditional school system was so problematic, as we can see with critical race theory in the South, it was such an issue. Um, so I wanted a space that allowed a little more leeway, um, which I found in museums, but I also saw that museums are great for gatekeeping items um, that are not theirs. <laughs> And I felt as though when students come in, you know, to the museums for their tours, for their workshops, it's important for them to see someone who looks like them. It's important for them to see, have someone who is of that culture talking of the culture, um, as opposed to just solely seeing, for the most part, museums are white women um, teaching cultures that are, at the end of the day, not theirs. Um, and that's problematic. <laughs> um, just because you don't understand the nuances of the culture of the people and you only get that from experience. Um, so yeah, it's so important to have, it's specifically black educators, which it's hardly seen within museums. Um, and that's just so, that's a problem. So it's important to have black educators to begin with. And then from there, other BIPOC folks as well. So that piece, not just students, but adults can see themselves. Um, in whatever space it is that we're in. No, well, thank you so much, Rebecca. You really hit on some points, and you really um, talked about, you know, you know what spaces allow, you know, your your mind to be able to, you know, experiment and and really like um, hone in on things that you might not be able to do in certain settings. So, you know, a K to 12 setting versus maybe a museum or a cultural institution setting, and what you're allowed to do. And I think. Some of the commonalities, though, is that um, the what that you're not able to do is like this common thing. It's like you can't do this one common thing, or you have you know pushback on this one common thing, which is you know telling the truth. You know, on whether you're in K to twelve or whether you're in a museum setting um, or cultural institution. And as another um, fellow, you know, black woman who is in um, who works within different cultural institutions, um, it you know those you can see those facts, you know, without reading somebody's statistics six years ago, you know, and that has you know you met, you think about the the hoarding of space you know, within the spaces that we feel like um, more Black and BIPOC people should be, um, you know, it's all, you know, very structural and, um, you know, you're really looking at your hiring and you're, you're feeding people out. Um, but I really appreciate your perspectives on that. And even for myself, um, you know, having it, ha centering Blackness as an, as a, forefront not an afterthought and the and let's do this too or you know also not doing you know you have to do the work to actually be proficient enough and competent 
enough and responsible enough and, and empathetic enough to even put yourself in front of the, these, these audiences, youth or adult, to even get it right. And, and um, what's, a, what's, a, what's a shame is with the hoarding and stuff, um, you, you rarely get the chance to have the, the 50% be BIPOC or, you know, and Black and you, you you miss out a whole perspective and then you get the one of that just so happened to get in there and it's like a whole thing on your back so you know it's, it's some real life stuff so I really appreciate um you all you know thinking about this because this is like some everyday stuff I think for for us um um another question that we uh have kind of been thinking about together are you know you know now that you find yourselves in this work you know where there um were there other like mentors or other people close to you that like you saw doing this work or you read about or you, you know, um, they whispered to you in your ear, like, you know, how did you, what, what reflections did you see, you know, in maybe the journey that you're in now, um, you know, as far as education or whatever intersections that leads you to, um, yeah. Um, I think for me, uh, it was a, a really about, um, you know, when I first entered like the, the arts education field and even like the arts education world um, last year, I recognized that there was a lot of work that needed to be done. And um, I really just wanted to send teaching artists to Ghana. Like that was like my only thing I really wanted to do, I thought it was really cool and innovative and doing hip hop in Ghana and connecting with indie artists there. And um, the more I became a part of the arts education world, I realized that there was a lot of gaps for black educators. And, you know, there wasn't really a framework that I saw for arts education for for black kids and, you know, black, any child loves art. We know that art is something that every kid relates to and it is critical and, and crucial in our schools and it's evident that we need black education in our schools so why not combine the both and we're talking about all of the things we want to do yet we don't have those toolboxes right so you know me just having conversations with folks in the field and being really encouraging and supportive um in my quest to fill that gap has been um really instrumental and in, uh, doing a pedagogical framework was not something that I thought I would be doing or doing like theoretical research in a serve like a national survey it's not anything that I planned on doing, but I think we all could relate to you know the virtue of being BIPOC and black and uh, female identifying that we go in with doing a certain thing, but end up doing a lot more work, but doing a lot more impact um, and that's what my experience has been and I'm I'm very fortunate to have the Melody Educators Collective as a point of reference and many, many mentors who who have been guiding me and I would not be able to do the work that I'm doing today if it wasn't for literally a village. It really it, it takes a village. It, it, I, I absolutely 100% believe that. <laughs> Yeah, because it's hard out here. So yeah, it's so hard. <laughs> it is so hard. It's some hostile stuff. Like it's some hostile stuff. You know what I mean? Like teachers in these rooms. Like we're out here, and, and it's just like you pay like a dollar a minute. Okay. But what um, I've noticed, like, <laughs> you know, to be honest, like the arts education world, I've I've been like it's very cozy. Like everyone like wants to hang with each other, but outside of that, like talking to educators, you know, black or it doesn't even matter. It's it's kind of, it, it feels hostile and it feels sort of like, um, I don't know, like it just doesn't feel like communal and like kind of cutthroatish. I don't know. I don't know if, I don't know if you all have had that experience, but like, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate for the community I have because I know how hard it could be um, doing this type of work, like innovative work. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's just kind of the world, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, so as far as the cut though, I have experienced that and the times I've experienced it within majority of white educators, like I get it, you feel that I'm taking up a spot that you feel still belongs to you. 
Um, when I feel that among other communities of color, I have to always think there are so many spots and they are forcing us to compete for this very, these very few spots. And I always have to keep that in mind um, that it's difficult, uh, particularly like for myself in the museum field, it is virtually almost impossible to find an open position that hasn't already been designated to someone else. Um, so yeah, that in itself, it's very cutthroat. Like someone's cousin or their mm -hmm. aunt or uncle. Right. It's like the people you know, it's like, that's what I realized too, is like the networking. Like networking mm -hmm. is so important when it comes to doing any sort of like entrepreneurial work, um, especially in education, trying to get, you know, ahead. It's really about who you know. And like, if you are, you know, got yourself from A to B, like how, like, you know what I mean? So it's, it's mm -hmm. you're already, you already got a default and it just, um, it just sucks. It, it, it really does suck. Um, but it's, it's the reality of, of the situation. Um, the more that we talk about it, hopefully people <laughs> will be more transparent about this is real. Like this is really an issue and it's keeping back a lot of great educators from mm -hmm. you know, being um, not only, I think successful, you know, obviously, but um, you know, get paid equally. That's really important. Like we all know that struggle. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> um you know you both make some really great points you know it, it's kind of like it's kind of like a weird paradigm because it's like we know that over 85 percent of our you know children are you know being taught by white women but then also now you know narrow it down to a specific field then we come you know less and less and then the, you know the lack of in you know um sciences and, and math and things like that and um you know, and then specifically when we're talking about in the arts and cultural sector, once again, we become these one ofs and, um, you know, you're just kind of like, man, you're holding all this weight. Like, if it's not me, then who? So let's do this right. But then the people around you not trying to pull the amount of like the amount of work that has to be done for 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 everybody, not just black and BIPOC educators for all of us to do the right thing, it take, it's gonna take a lot of work. And my thing is like, get those folks out of here who can't you know, step up to the plate to at least deliver and be competent on certain things. Get them out of here. Cause you're right, Rebecca, we got spaces to fill, you know? And um, because everybody has a journey, you know, no matter you know, what way they walk, everybody has a journey. And if it's in, you know, these educational spaces, you know, there's definitely some, um, you know, some, some like water you're going to have to tread through. The one thing I will, you know, add to is specifically, you know, and shoot after, <clears throat> you know, with, you know, after the civil war and even before the civil war, I mean, you know, black people being literate is like, you know, for free is freedom, you know, having your own control of your mind and soul. And then, you know, people were finding ways to communicate and be literate in so many other ways than, you know, this English, you know, language that, you know, uses like these letters, you know, and, um, you know, you, we have to educate ourselves. And then when you come into our schools, you don't like what we're teaching because we're teaching the truth. And, you know, educators are literally being threatened. We have educators today, you know, their books being banned and things like that. So, you know, and that's why there's so many other different supplemental schools and homeschooling. So, you know, just thinking about that leading into our other question, um, you know, thinking about just the importance of, you know, that representation. Um, Melissa, you talked about you know, there's a whole genre of peoples who are who are also creatives, you know, and they actually call themselves educators. And like this whole genre of peoples offer so many different intersections of, of you know, knowledge within, you know, education that you're, you're leaving out, you know, um, you know, speak more to about, you know, the importance of, you know, that type of, um, body being in a classroom, you know, and, you know, balancing out or not just a classroom, you know, wherever you find your spaces, you know, the importance of getting that data and the importance of being represented, you know, and being seen in those spaces. 
Yeah, it's such an important um, topic. And I love talking about it because this is what the work I do. And, um, and I think it just stems back to me and how I view myself as a person. Um, you know, I went to school for secondary education um, and having my professors telling me that I am an educator that's you know, teachers, uh, kids need and, um, you know, and I don't know, I just everyone has their thing and everyone, you know, uh, you know, pursues whatever they love and I do love teaching. However, I don't like the system. I don't like any New York City system and I don't think black identifying or you know, kids from the diaspora. Um, we're, we're a different culture like we we have a different experience and you know segregation is only a generation away and you know my parents they were from the caribbean and born 65 and 67 you know independent that's around independence in the caribbean like we're all really new like we're new to all of this and and to not acknowledge that is really tough and um being an educator is tough so and, and being a black educator is even more tough i'm a black female you know it's it's even smaller so it, it all I have to say is that, you know, looking at educator and being black is in itself is unique. And I think instead of looking at it from the perspective of, you know, you went to school for secondary education and got your college degree and got your master's, you know, that's just not it. You know, we see that mentors are are folks who, you know, look like us and, you know, especially black and brown kids, they might not see themselves in their school teachers, but they might see themselves in like their after school teacher or, you know, uh, people, I don't know, other folks who, who, who look at them in the school, but might not be an educator because they have that same lived experience and lived experience is as equally as important than, you know, learning your, you know, mathematics, you know, it's, and you could teach mathematics through your lived experiences and um, letting black creatives know that whatever you do and put out in the world you're teaching people you're whatever you innovate whatever you think creatively it has never been done before you know because a because it's your you're creative but you're also black so like you've got this double whammy and not all black black creative you know ought to be a, in this field but here's a pathway for you to because you already it um but it's 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 about being in those spaces and telling those educators and and being you know you know with artists and telling them that um there is an option and i pride myself on the work and i do because i am an example of it i um trained with the teaching artist project i got a scholarship for it because i i emailed them and said hey like i want to learn alongside these teaching artists they gave me that opportunity i realized there was no um, data on black teaching artists. I figured out I got connected with some folks helped me do research. I'm a part of a fellowship so they could help me with my 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 work and this is all done through my want and needs and and to be an educator in a, in a conventional way. That's a long story, but I think it's really important that folks could see me I, I am what I walk to walk I talk to talk and um you know i i can't wait until there's little melissa's running around not personal little babies are great but like you know little you know little kids not kids you know you know what i mean everyone knows what i'm talking about but um yeah that's my big spiel <laughs> and i'm sure you all have heard me talk about this all the time but um, no you're but. it's perfectly fine take take up that space what were you going to say Re uh, rebecca no, I was going to say, yeah, I completely agree. Um, so often the arts are undervalued within our communities. Um, and that has to do more with not because it's not important or valuable, but because we are constantly on survival mode. And it's always seen as though the arts, you are not going to have a lucrative career with that. Um, and then we have the aspect where higher education, it's, it's such a priority. Um, but we understand that because of structural inequalities, it's not accessible to everyone. But oftentimes without higher education, you can't get into certain systems. So there has to be an avenue on specifically for Black artists to be able to, as you mentioned, like to mentor or to be um, 
to be able to be with children, with families who can learn from them, who can see themselves in these artists, who can also feel as though, hey, maybe this is something I can do as well. So I completely understand the importance of having um, just Black artists and being able to have that specifically within our schools, within culture centers, um, just within the community. Um, for myself, um, I identify as a Taino woman. So, and just the fact that I say that my existence is questioned um, because several hundred years ago, some Spaniards decided to say that we no longer exist. Um, so it's, for me, it's so important for other students to be able to say, oh, you're Boricua. Oh, you identify as Taino. Okay, so I, I can do that too. And it's like, yeah, of course, no one is allowed to tell you you can't. That is part of your ancestry as well. And it's, it, to me, that's like one of the main things for me when it comes to, um, especially like within the museums, a lot of the work I do is with indigeneity and it's so important to just, rewrite that narrative that we're extinct, we're not extinct. No, we're people, we're living here today. We're not stuck in time. No, we're like everyone else. Um, and specifically with Taino um, indigeneity to be able to bring that to the forefront so that um, individuals are, feel comfortable saying it out loud. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, I really appreciate how you both really just, you know, broke down like where it, where it shows up, where it's already bit like been in your lives for you to kind of walk into this already. But then also, you know, it takes a, a long time to kind of recognize what you're doing, like, oh, snap, like, you know, this is really meaningful. And like, this is one of the ways that I really want to walk and show up in my classroom or wherever, wherever spaces that you go. And, you know, especially, um, you know, when you think about the importance of Black and BIPOC educators and whatever spaces that we wind up in because we are we teach and approach so many different ways, um, you know, to be able to show up as your whole person too, you know, because like, you know, especially, I mean, and you know, I'm not even going to restrict this to like just youth, you know, even with adults, like, and your adult friends will see like, well, how is Melissa when we're somewhere else? And how is Melissa when I'm talking to all together at MEC, like, you know, what's, what's Jahan like, you know, in the streets and then what's Jahan like when we in the galleries? It's like, Jahan's the same, the same person, you know, always about that life. If you're ready, we can talk about um, uh, Alma Thomas and Picasso at the same time. What do you want to do? You know, like we can do it all together, you know, let's talk about it. Or, you know, are we going to be flip-flopping with our children and really not like, you know, listening to them or even thinking about our, you know, what audiences that we put ourselves into and like valuing their, um, their stories and where they see, you know, like when you're specifically thinking about like being educated or find or, 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 um, you know, uh, demonstrating knowledge, because we all demonstrate it in so many different ways, especially with our various cultures and stuff. It's like, you know, I don't, I know what time of year it is when it's, you know, carnival, you know, I know what time of year it is, you know, and that's a cultural thing, you know, um, but also, you know, showing about like, where does it show up in your work? So, you know, um, Rebecca, you mentioned about, you know, having um, that centering and, and intersection with, you know, your ind indigeneity and, you know, things like that. And, I know when it brings down like, well, how do you actually do it? Cause you know, I've been to things and they're just like, tell me how it's done. You know, so what do you actually do? And I'm just like, were well, you not in this webinar for an hour with everybody, <laughs> Melissa? Like, I don't know if you peeped that one, but I was like, Melissa, her whole thing, she, she does it like, but, um, you know, just thinking about, you know, how does it actually show up like in your work, like, you know, like for me, for example, um, you know, we want to talk about math. Well, you know, you might be used to talking about math and numerals, but I'd like to talk about math in African fractals and in the uh, Aborigines art, uh, dream artwork. That's how I want to talk about math. You know, when we're talking about time, you know, I want to talk about the spider woman. You know what I'm saying? She's like, listen, I, I can't do this for all of y'all. Let me make some, let me make a drink. You know, let me make something for all of you. You know, I want to bring in culture to, to be a synonym to, to a other different type of access and like 
wisdoms that are already in our DNA. You want to talk about engineering? Well, I want to talk about like the oldest e Ethiopian churches. You know what I'm saying? Like that's what that's the type of architecture I'm talking about. Those are the math equations that I'm saying talking about. We're not worrying about how you're presenting that math. Even that's been you know <laughs> you know kind of uh, thinned out. But you know, just talking about like where does it show up in your work? So I really appreciate that. Um, you all mentioning that. Did you all want to um, say anything else? I mean, you talked a lot about, I think we all sort of all talked about like culturally responsive learning um, as sort of hopefully being like the new normal. <laughs> I think we've been so used to like Western uh, philosophy and culture, and which I think holds, uh, you know, we shouldn't abandon it. I think it, it definitely holds value in, in like, you know, the ether, but it, it shouldn't be truth and i think verse we hold it as truth and that's just um it's scary for folks you know and i and i say that because i you know i i do a lot of work in puerto rico and uh you know their experience being black is different than my experience being black and i didn't recognize that and in a lot of the conversations i was like we were just we're you know our experiences are the same and it's like it's not like being black in puerto rico is very different and your experiences and a way in which you look at your blackness and your identity is completely different um and i say this because it it's still hard for me to kind of understand you know um just by virtue of just not knowing uh imagine if i was white like imagine like what white people are dealing with and, and grappling with or you know imagine thinking that you understand you know blackness or black identity and it just you know flips it on the head it's like okay maybe maybe that was sort of racist and maybe I, what i thought was racist and i have you know i'm dating this person and and and, and having those kind of conversations are difficult and i'm sure it's happening more often but um you know it's just it's it's not know we're living in an interesting time and i and i think um it's it's scary for institutions like the museums, which is majority white, and universities are majority white. And I'm just curious to see where this um, takes them. I don't know any thoughts on that. Because you both work in museums, and I'm sure that you've both have had and and shared already um, experiences. But like, do you have, do you, do you, what do you, what's your thoughts on like just the people that are in those spaces who hold those powers? Do you think that they have like any sort of fear or like openness to changing it up that's not centering them? Um, yeah, <laughs> fear. <laughs> they have lots of fear that, yes. Um, there are some who are open to change and I appreciate that. Um, and for those who are not open to change, I always, you know, I tell them, cause I have, I acknowledge that I have privilege. Um, and I tell them, you know, as someone who is of lighter skin tone, who lives in the US, I can acknowledge my privilege. You as a full European descent white person, how is it you can acknowledge your privilege? And that kind of gets them thinking a little bit like, okay, I kind of see where you're coming from. Um, but a lot of that fear is just, it's ignorance. It's ignorance and it comes down to just not being fully educated in how this country was founded, the history of the world. Um, they hold Western ideology to such a standard that everything else is just, it's, it's not up to their standard, it's not equivalent. Um, and like specifically within museums, like for instance, when I talk about indigeneity, I am very clear about the truth. I'm very clear that several people were murdered. Um, children were taken away from their parents and sent to schools where they themselves there um, died. And until recently, we are finding their remains. Um, when I talk about the US, I don't start with the US began when a bunch of Europeans decided to come over. No, it existed for thousands of years. This, this land existed for thousands of years and was um, well taken care of for thousands of years. Um, so for me, it's just so important to be very clear and very 
blunt with people, um, but I know that I'm able to do that because I have a privilege. Um, they are because of their mindset and because of racism and colorism, they're able to look at me and accept to a certain degree what I'm saying. And so I try my best to use that to amplify, you know, again, censoring indigenous um, and black stories as much as I can, because it's happening, whether they like it or not. Um, <laughs> we are entering these spaces and we are no longer willing to perform and exist for their gaze, for the white gaze. Like we are gonna exist and we are gonna be as we are for our own people. And yeah, they're gonna have to deal with it. And so I'm very much like, mm, okay. <laughs> when it comes to that with them, like, all right, they're just gonna have to figure it out. <laughs> Yeah, I, told, I totally feel you on that. And, you know, you're, we're not working by ourselves. You know, we might, everybody has their preferences. You know, honestly, you know, when you choose to put yourself in front of, you know, people to, you know, like serve them, because I consider myself like I serve people with my creativity and stuff, no matter where, what, you know, spaces I find myself in. Like, I think you do have an accountability to like strive to always sharpen your, you know, skills and like be, you know, up on what are the different things going on that can, that you can best use your, you know, perspective to teach. And I think you're doing a real disadvantage, you know, whether whatever spaces you're in by, you know, talking down to people and, you know, um, limiting the, the connections that the rest of the world has had, you know, in relationship to the, to, 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 you know, Western worldview. Um, you know, at the same time, when you actually like, it's not like a figment of your imagination. Like there are just literally people not getting hired for like the right job. You know, it's like literally people are choosing one type of person over other applicants. Like it's really that simple. Like it's your HR, like it's your HR over hundreds of years, <laughs> you know, with that mindset. And then legally not being able to let Black and BIPOC people, you know, even go to any of these spaces, your library, anywhere, you know, and then you, <clears throat> then you deliberately on top of that, go another X amount of years, decades by like not hiring to the point where like, you don't have 50% of your, you know, management staff being BIPOC or non-binary, like the WTF, like what, what, it's really that simple, you know, so it's like, you not looking looking around and you're the only one like what's up with your hrs you know like and then on on also you know we all have a large spectrum of what you can educate you know be an educator of you know english history in my case art and all these other things like if you're also limiting like how you what people's skills can bring to the table. There are many intersections that allow, you know, people to enter, you know, a certain thing. So like, if you have an anthropology history, you know, um, writing, you know, background, you could potentially be, you know, a great person to work at, say, in a cultural institution or an art space, you know, like just, you know, it's like, you have to also widen, like, who can also bring different skills to a space and all the intersections, because I have so many different layers of what Jahan is, and I'm bringing all that in front of the children, you know, I wear my hair out on purpose, I wear my jewelry on purpose, you know what I'm saying, like, you know, um, I tell you that I know where you live, like, I, I know I've walked past, like, that area, you know, like, I'm letting you know, like, oh, yeah, you know, I just got off the train, so, you know, I'm telling you all of my different, you know, layers to, you know, bring some personalization to it, but um, it's really that simple, and it's, it's kind of like, well, what do you do when just people aren't hiring the people, you know, and you're in that space. So, you know, and I think also having the individuals be able to work just as hard as you to be the best you can be in front of those spaces, that's important too. And that can be very hard, um, hard if those individuals aren't like able to work as hard as you too. Um, so I really appreciate um, some of your comments about that because it's, it's like stuff we think about every day, right? Like brushing my teeth, like, hmm, how am I gonna be a great black educator today? <laughs> you know? But um, what I wanted to go into um, your, uh, Melissa, your wonderful survey that you opened up that uh, jumped off this week. 
um, about Black teaching artists, um, I wanted to make sure that we had some time and space for you to kind of like go in on that and like um, why that data is so important. Um, it's very important to, to me to be counted like at my whole self. So what are um, some, you know, information about that survey? Well, thank you for giving me space to plug. <laughs> um, yeah, as we're doing uh, one of the first surveys, national surveys on uh, Black teaching or Black identifying, uh, BIPOC identifying teaching artists um, that has been done, we're trying to get at least 100 participants uh, in order to collect really demographic and ethnographic uh, data on this demographic, you know, really asking about your age, asking about your gender, asking about um, how much you're getting paid as a teaching artist, if you feel seen as a teaching artist, being BIPOC or Black. Um, and this information is just incredibly critical because we don't know who are, who's in the field. We don't necessarily know that have those numbers that we could pull from. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons why I chose to do this is because I was writing my business plan and it came back to the marketing section of your business plan. If anyone knows, you know, anything about business plan, you got to do your marketing and know who your dark target demographic is. Um, and I didn't necessarily know and we guesstimated. Um, and then I went to my partners who do um, surveys and do policy making in the arts and I asked them, you know, what is can you give me some statistics, some data, some quantifiable data so I can use for my business plan? They didn't have any. And I was like, but you do this work, you're doing all this work and you're not asking who the people are serving. Um, so I, I took five and six months um, of this year really focusing on, you know, doing some research, doing finding some references in order to curate these questions in order for me to collect the data I need to get. Um, that we all need um, and you know with the goal this is a pre uh, report survey we're hoping to use that information in order to do ethnographic research in different parts of the diaspora so being you know ethnographic research in Puerto Rico like um, the Afro Rico community there and uh, the Afro Hawaiian and you know going to Brazil um, and I think another important thing for me too is that you know educational systems hold the most information about you. Um, so I think it's just really important to to be able to collect information about ourselves by someone and in, in, uh, my LLC's Black Teaching Artist Lab, an organization that does that. Um, I think it's really important. I could have done it with a university and I could have done it through a grant or through a sponsor like, uh, uh, but you know, this is just a part of the work. Again, being a Black educator, is this is just what you got to do. And um, I'm really excited. So if anyone is a Black identifying teaching artist or a creative or thinker, please fill out the survey. Go on my Instagram, Black Teaching Artist Lab. The link is in the bio. Um, it only takes 10 minutes. Um, and it's really making a difference. You know, uh, Black educators or Black thinkers who are going to be writing grants to do their work could use this information. So um, you're going to be helping a lot of folks, um, as well as, you know, helping me. <laughs> so, um, and yeah, I think you both took the survey too, so you could attest that it was um, good and it was easy and it wasn't too painful. Um, <laughs> no, it was did, good. It was good. Thank you. Um, but Rebecca, you did, you did bring up, um, and I really thought about this. I, know, I hope it's not too late, um, but, um, the word black like the experience of being black like that word itself is like um it's just it's so interesting like um my, i was talking to my friend who is uh puerto rican um but he doesn't he identifies himself as black but he like but he didn't identify as black before when he was growing up but like he's afro descendant but now he identifies as black and i'm like wait like i don't get the chance to, to just not identify as black so it just it really it brought up the word like black versus afro descendant that was also something that i was like had a difficulty even talking about the my organization's name black teaching artist lab like, that gives off a certain connotation and um 
I don't know. It's just sem semantics is interesting. <sighs> no, um, I, well, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Rebecca, go ahead. No, you can go. Um, I was just going to say that, well, one of the things I did appreciate was that you had so many different, you know, options of how people can, you know, choose to identify like the slashes are serious. So I appreciate that because I'm a black woman and that's all you need to know, period. Now you, you know, ride the train with me from, you know, North Philly to South Philly and we got a long ride. I might let you know some of my, you know, layers, but, you know, now I'm a black woman and I appreciated that, you know, and I could even identify with some of those other slashes. So I, I actually appreciated, you know, those types of um you know um just honoring how you've heard or understood or seen how other people can identify themselves yeah so i wanted to before filling out the survey i wanted to make sure that um it was my opinion you were looking for um as a woman of color who is not black um i do identify as someone of African descent, because the reality is, yes, half of my family is of African descent. Um, they too were enslaved in the Caribbean. Um, but I have to also acknowledge that I do not have the lived experience of a black woman. And that that is something to honor um, and not to take lightly. Um, so for myself, I it's, it's difficult because there are a lot of, um, individuals who don't necessarily, okay, who are un, who are ambiguously Black, um, say it that way. Um, and there's a privilege in, as you mentioned with your friend, of coming in and out of that Blackness, um, where some individuals just cannot. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to be very sure that it was appropriate for me to fill it out. Um, and I am very thankful for the slashes <laughs> because the reality is that we have so many different identities. We have so many different layers. Um, so I appreciate that and yeah. Excellent. So we will make sure that that link is um, on our uh, Facebook uh, channel and everything. So um, we had such a great conversation tonight and, you know, I hope this has kind of intrigued you all to, you know, stop in to see if you want to be involved with MEC, um, Melanated Educators of Color. We're based in Philadelphia. We have a, a new general meeting coming up November 13th. I'll be there. We'll be, you know, just going over a little bit more information about the, the organization and what we're doing in Philly and what we're striving to do and also just share stories on your experiences, uh, maybe your first experiences of, you know, having a Black or BIPOC educator in your life and just sharing stories of, um, you know, your education and, um, you know, teaching experiences. So we really appreciate you uh, tuning in with us tonight. Thank you so much, Melissa and Rebecca, for all your wisdom and every thank you for all the work that you do. It's so needed um, and it's really, really important. Um, because we're gonna, you know, we're we're serving all of the little somebodies that are like, wow, look at Miss Rebecca, look at Miss Melissa, you know. So we're out here, and then thank you so much, Karen, for all the back end and everything like that. Um, we really appreciate it. So um, with that, I guess we'll we'll holla at everybody. Um, tune in again. We're gonna try to do this a little bit more often, and um, just be tuned. Uh, stay updated to our Facebook page, and we look forward to hopefully seeing some um, new people join in on our uh, general meeting on November thirteenth, Saturday at three o'clock. Okay, thank uh, Eastern. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Night. Night, everyone. Bye.